My new book, Peace Over Pain, is now available. You can buy it for $20 on Amazon or you can download it for free inside my exclusive Facebook group. Simply go to peaceoverpain.com slash join the group. And between the group and the book, you will learn how to eliminate chronic conditions. Welcome to Inner Peace with Dr. Reese, a program that can help you become liberated in the modern world. Now, here's your host, Dr. Kevin W. Reese. Have you ever read or listened to the Diamond Sutra? Welcome to episode number 162. Today, I'm joined by James Gattuso and Joe Lachance to read one of the Buddha's most prestigious teachings called the Diamond Sutra. It was actually the first printed book in human history translated by the Chinese after the sutras were brought from India to China. It's a documentation of Gautama, the Buddha, sitting down in a park with about 1,200 of his monks performing what's called a satsang, or a meeting in truth. Then one of his best disciples, named Sabuti, steps up to the Buddha and starts to ask questions. The Buddha then supplies Sabuti with teachings, which were recorded and passed down through the centuries. The Diamond Sutra was a big part of my journey, and that's why I wanted to deliver it to you on this podcast. So I will be playing the part of the Buddha, Joe Lachance will be playing the part of the narrator, and James Gattuso will be playing the part of Sabuti. There might be some big words that you may not know, such as Tathagata, which is another word for Buddha, or Bodhisattva, which means an advanced monk or someone that's on the verge of what's called enlightenment. It's also important to understand that the word Buddha simply means the awakened one. And so the Buddha is just a nickname because there have been many Buddhas, many awakened ones in human history. It's just the Buddha is the most famous or some might say the second most famous, behind Jesus, the Christ. I recommend that you sit down and really relax while you listen to this. It took me five or six times in my life to even understand it. Enjoy. This is what I heard one time when the Buddha was staying in the monastery in the park in the Jetta Grove near Shravasti with a community of 1,250 fully ordained monks. That day, when it was time to make the alms round, the Buddha put on his sagati robe and holding his bowl, went into the town of Shravastri to beg for alms, going from house to house. When the alms round was completed, He returned to the monastery to eat the midday meal. Then he put away his sagati robe and his bowl, washed his feet, arranged his cushion, and sat down. At that time, the venerable Sabuti stood up, bared his right shoulder, put his knee on the ground, and joining his palms respectfully, said to the Buddha, World honored one, it is rare to find someone like you. You always support and place confidence in the bodhisattvas. If sons and daughters of good families want to give rise to the highest, most fulfilled, awakened mind, what should they rely on? And what should they do to master the mind? Sabuti, bodhisattvas must meditate on the following. Whether born from eggs, from the womb, from moisture, or spontaneously, whether have form or do not have form, whether they have perceptions or do not have perceptions, or whether it cannot be said of them 
that they have perceptions or that they do not have perceptions, we must lead all these beings to nirvana so that they can be liberated. Yet, when this innumerable, immeasurable, infinite number of beings has become liberated, we do not, in truth, think that a single being has been liberated. Why is this so? If Sabuti, a bodhisattva, still has the notion of a self, a person, a living being, or a lifespan exists, that person is not a true bodhisattva. Moreover, Sabuti, when bodhisattvas practice generosity, they do not rely on any object, any form, sound, smell, taste, touch, or object of mind to practice generosity. That, Sabuti, is the spirit in which bodhisattvas practice generosity, not relying on signs. Why? If bodhisattvas practice generosity without relying on signs, the happiness that results cannot be conceived of, Sabuti. Do you think that the space in the eastern quarter can be conceived of or even measured? No, world honored one. Sabuti, can space in the western, southern, or northern quarters above or below be conceived of or measured? No, world honored one. Sabuti, if bodhisattvas do not rely on any concept while practicing generosity, the happiness that results from that virtuous act is like space. It cannot be conceived or measured. Sabuti, the bodhisattvas should let their minds dwell in the teachings I have just given. What do you think, Sabuti? Is it possible to recognize the Tathagata by means of bodily signs? No, world honored one. When the Tathagata speaks of bodily signs, there are no signs being talked about. The Buddha said to Sabuti, In a place where there are signs, in that place there is deception. If you can see the signless nature of signs, you can see the Tathagata. The Venerable Sabuti said to the Buddha, In times to come, Will there be people who, when they hear these teachings, have real faith in them? The Buddha replied, Do not speak that way, Sabuti. Five hundred years after the Tathagata has passed away, there will still be people who appreciate the joy and happiness that come from observing the precepts. When such people hear these words, they will have faith that this is the truth. Know that such people have sown wholesome seeds not only during the lifetime of one Buddha or even two, three, four, or five Buddhas, but have, in fact, planted wholesome seeds during the lifetimes of tens of thousands of Buddhas. Anyone who for even a moment, gives rise to a pure and clear confidence upon hearing these words of the Tathagata. The Tathagata sees and knows that person, and they will attain immeasurable merit because of this understanding. Why? Because that person is not caught in the idea of a self a person, a living being, or a lifespan. They are not caught in the idea of the Dharma or the non-Dharma, a sign or no sign. 
Why? If you are caught in the idea of the Dharma, you are also caught in the ideas of a self, a person, a living being, and a lifespan. If you are caught in the idea that there is no Dharma, you are still caught in the ideas of a self, a person, a living being, and a lifespan. That is why you should not get caught in the idea that this is the Dharma or that this is not the Dharma. This is the hidden meaning when the Tathagata says, you should know that the Dharma that I teach is like a raft. You should let go of the Dharma, let alone what is not the Dharma. The Buddha asked Sabuti, in ancient times, when the Tathagata practiced under the guidance of the Buddha Dipankara, did the Tathagata attain anything? Subhuti answered, No, world honored one. In ancient times, when the Tathagata practiced under the guidance of the Buddha Dipankara, he did not attain anything. What do you think, Subhuti? Does a bodhisattva adorn a Buddha field? No, world honored one. Why? To adorn a Buddha field is not in fact to adorn a Buddha field. That is why it is called adorning a Buddha field. The Buddha said, So, Sabuti, all the bodhisattvas should give rise to a pure, and clear mind in this spirit. When they give rise to this mind, they should not rely on form, sound, smell, taste, touch, or object of mind. They should give rise to an intention with their minds not dwelling anywhere. So, Sabuti, when bodhisattvas give rise to the unequaled mind of awakening, they should let go of all ideas. They should not rely on form when they give rise to that mind, nor on sound, smell, taste, touch, or object of mind. They should only give rise to the mind that is not dwelling anywhere. The Tathagata has said, that all notions are not notions, and that all living beings are not living beings. Sabuti, the Tathagata is one who speaks of things as they are, speaks what is true, and speaks in accord with reality. He does not speak falsely. He only speaks in this way. Sabuti, if we say, that the Tathagata has realized a teaching, that teaching is neither true nor false. Sabuti, bodhisattvas who still depend on notions to practice generosity are like someone walking in the dark. They do not see anything, but when bodhisattvas do not depend on any object of mind to practice generosity, they are like someone with good eyesight walking under the light of the sun. They can see all shapes and all colors. Subhuti, do not say that the Tathagata has the idea. I will bring living beings to the shore of liberation. Do not think that way, Subhuti. Why? In truth, there is no living being for the Tathagata to bring to the other shore. If the Tathagata were to think there was, he would be caught in the idea of a self, a person, a living being, or a lifespan. Sabuti, what the Tathagata calls a self, essentially is not a self, in the way that ordinary people say there is a self. Sabuti, the Tathagata does not consider those ordinary people as ordinary people. That is why he can call them ordinary people.
What do you think, Sabuti? Can someone visualize the Tathagata by means of the 32 marks? Sabuti said. Yes, World Honored One. We should use the 32 marks to visualize the Tathagata. The Buddha said. If you say that you can use the 32 marks to visualize the Tathagata, then is the Kakravartin also a Tathagata? Sabuti said. World Honored One, I understand your teaching. One should not use the 32 marks to visualize the Tathagata. Then the World Honored One spoke this verse. Someone who looks for me in form or seeks me in sound is on a mistaken path and cannot see the Tathagata. Sabuti, if you think that the Tathagata realizes the highest, most fulfilled, awakened mind and does not need to use all the signs, you are wrong. Sabuti, do not think in this way. Do not think that when one gives rise to the highest, most fulfilled, awakened mind, one needs to see all objects of mind as non-existent, cut off from life. Do not think in this way. One who gives rise to the highest, most fulfilled, awakened mind does not say that all objects of mind are non-existent and cut off from life. After they heard the Lord Buddha deliver this discourse, the Venerable Sabuti, the Bhikshus and the Bhikshunis, laymen and laywomen, and gods and asuras, filled with joy and confidence, put these teachings into practice. Yeah, it's interesting that the Diamond Sutra that I've been listening to for all these years is a little different. It's bigger. Mm. So this mm. version is, I think, like a, a cut down version. Edited Sub version. Subuti talks a lot more. Mm. In, mm. in his sad saying. So it is. Yeah. Weird. Yeah. I noticed it's different, like different to quite a few of the translations that I found online, yeah. but it's as short as not too bad for this uh, format anyway, you know? So James, being a young <laughs> man on the path. Yeah. What do you get out of the Diamond Sutra? I think the fact that the Buddha speaks to what a lot of seekers experience in the sense that as a seeker, you can believe you're a bodhisattva and then it's your mission to awaken others. And if that's there, you're not truly awake, right? There's still that sense of personhood. And I think that was what was so profound in the Diamond Sutra is the, is the dissolving of the person as an essential axiom of the teachings. And juxtaposed with that, is, the Buddha talks in negatives. So he's not giving the mind anything, any concepts, any beliefs, anything to grasp with, anything to cling to. And so even reading that, even experiencing that with you guys, and, and reading it in my own time, I just feel that spaciousness expanding inside me, which is where the Buddha is taking all of us. Mm. I think that was quite profound. Yeah, you know, in the version that I've been listening to for years, he says that even if someone were to memorize four lines from this, yeah. they could yeah. become, quote unquote, enlightened, liberated. Mm. Mm. And that's how powerful that this sutra is mm. because mm. I, I know when I first started listening to it, which was many years ago, I mean, it took me five times to understand it five, six mm. times. Um, now I understand every word mm. and, uh, it's you know, the first thing that came to my mind was the movie, the matrix mm. and how things weren't real. Mm. And yeah, that's kind of what he's telling Sabuti is like, can someone be enlightened? No, someone can't be enlightened because there's no someone. 
mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. can you become a bodhisattva? You know, can you this? Can you that? No, you can't because you don't exist. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and you, you see, he said the word reality in there. You and know. even the very, for a quote unquote enlightened being, even the question of enlightenment that doesn't arise <laughs> because everything is in flux. Every state is flexible. So this, this very notion that I am something, it, it, it can't be because the I that you're referring to is constantly changing and not real. And I think the Buddha is constantly trying to elude us to that fact yeah right? yeah and uh and some of the and i and i really love when it says it's you know n not dharma and it is your dharma right like yeah. doing both of the interrelated opposites and leaving you in the middle right in the one without a second non-duality <laughs> right yeah so, so these and and I find that going back to the roots of some of these key things that we experience in our modern civilization, right? So when someone speaks about mindfulness or the non-self or oneness and really going to the roots of where some of these concepts emerged from, there's something really powerful in doing that, I believe. And Joe, you know, you doing the narration in the first paragraph, he mentions, you know, 1,250 monks. That's right. a lot of monks with no microphone, obviously, yeah. 2,500 years ago. Yeah, that's a big satsang. <laughs> Can you imagine someone sitting there cross-legged with 1,200 monks? It, 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 it's, uh, it, it's kind of mind blowing. It, Osho did it. Yogananda used to do it. Osho, oh. I'm sure a lot of the great ones, Gandhi, did it. They had it's, microphones. It's it's, it's not. Um, it's a it's like still a huge feat. You know, it's still a huge deal. Yeah, with no microphone. <laughs> yeah, just like almost like in a park. Yeah. yeah, this is not in a in an auditorium <laughs> or or you know this is in a park. Yeah, it's hanging out twelve hundred and fifty people hanging out at the park and not partying, sitting down and listening. That's that's a big accomplishment. Yeah, and you figure twelve hundred people, <laughs> followers, monks. Uh, this has to be later on in his quote unquote career. Yeah. Um, you know, because if I recall, he started with five disciples. Mm. And mm. safe to say, things spread. <laughs> <laughs> and people started to hear, whoa, there's there's a Buddha over here in, in this corner of India. You know, let's, let's, let's go. And people started flocking to him. And uh, to this day... It's been said by many that he helped more people become enlightened than any other person who ever walked earth because his, his, um, he became that popular. Mm -hmm. He was, he was that dude to come to, um, for mindfulness and reality. And, uh, and he did it for 40 years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He, he's, I, I like to joke around that, you know, He's the Tom Brady of enlightenment. You know, he, he did it the longest. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he yeah. did it the longest, you know, and you know, that impact is still here today. It's still there. Yeah. It's still yeah. there today. Cause when you think about all the people that found their enlightenment and then taught others, but it's all off the tree of the Buddha, mm -hmm. the Buddha, Gautama, Siddhartha Gautama, the Buddha, mm -hmm. you know, so I, I always tell people, because I've done a lot of study in history. I've studied Einstein. I've studied Gandhi. I've, I've studied Ramana Maharshi. I've, I've studied a lot of people. And I always say that this is the most impactful guy, in my opinion, mm. that ever walked mm. earth. Mm. At least mm. that was recorded in some sort of way. Well, because I think it's interesting when you 
and if you want to break it up into the Occident and the East, right? Like, I think definitely you can make that claim for the East. And uh, I think Christ has to be there for the West. But sure. what is remarkable for me is that the Buddha was the, you know, Siddhartha Gautam is recorded to exist around 500 BC, right? So yep. 500 years before Christ. Yep. And I find, so, you know, I find that he really was the first prophet, messiah, saint, whatever word you want to put on it, enlightened being that has had such an impact like this. Yes. Yeah. yeah and I would say more than Lao Tzu. Mm. Yeah. More than Lao Tzu was a hermit. Mm, right. Lao Tzu was mm. a hermit in a cave. Yeah. <laughs> and he, uh, I love the story. He, he had he was some... ready to leave ready to leave right yeah. riding was... out riding out into the sunset he was riding out into the sunset and one of his disciples said no you can't go write down something and he just write this down before you leave and they made him write, they made him write the uh Tao Te, and then he left and that, <laughs> yeah. and that became the Tao Te Ching, which is a great book yeah but yeah. uh james it's interesting you said that 500 years before jesus in the diamond sutra he says, it's here. Where is it? He says that people 500 years later, and that, that stuck to me when I first heard it, because Jesus, yeah, Jesus mm. came 500 years later. I mean, they, that's, it's, it's almost like a lineage of mm. different prophets. And they mm. come around every 500 years, you know. You had mm -hmm. Lao Tzu, then you had Krishna. Mm -hmm. yeah, Krishna was long before these guys. Then Buddha. Krishna then and Jesus. Moses were around the same time, based on yeah. my timeline. That's a long yeah. time. We're talking 10,000 mm. years. Mm. Yeah. Mm. But Krishna, Krishna, is decide, Krishna was described as a blue dude. Mm, so yeah. we don't know if he's fantasy or or what yeah um and then you know you read the bhagavad gita you know there's some kind of mystical things going on there that mm, doesn't mm. sound very human um but you know there's interesting parallels there between what people can see in altered states of consciousness and like psychedelic states where they can mm. see beings and blue beings. And um, I wonder whether that is a description of an altered perceptual state, mm. uh, like a, like an avatar that can only be seen. He's not a physical being, right? But can be seen through a sort of level of spiritual awakening and wow. is almost interdimensional. I I don't know. We don't know, but it's, I think that, um, that, that is something that resonates with, for me, you know, when we start talking about nine foot tall, you know, yeah, the whole Hindu dudes. mythology is like, it's very good, very, mm -hmm. you know, but it's like, some of the stuff is like, where did that come from? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. But Hey, listen, I got to get going. All right. Um, that time already? Yeah, it's 10.30. I just want to uh, get ready, you know. Okay. All right, cool. Oh, actually, it was, yeah. Yeah. Um. So, yeah, I, wa I wanted to get this done because uh, I wanted someone else to, to hear this and understand it. And so I appreciate you guys coming on and reading this. It's like doing a play. So there is no self. That's the message of the That's day. That's the message of the day. There is no self. We're, we're just avatars. We're just vehicles walking in a video game, basically, right? That's it. <laughs> there is no self, right? I, I like to say that we're, uh, we're in a video game and we're collecting points. Yeah. And, and sometimes mm. you lose points. And so there's that credit debit thing going on with your points. You know, like if, mm. if you're healthy, it's good points. If you're unhealthy, mm -hmm. you lost some points, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and every now yeah. and then you'll find a treasure, a little treasure on the way, you know. Yeah. <laughs> you got to pick, like pick up the. Mario Brothers. You got to pick up the. 
life force you know you pick up mm -hmm. some life force all that different kind of stuff you can do <laughs> weapons i think there's also mushrooms in uh in, yeah there is yeah there is there's mushrooms in a lot of things <laughs> <laughs> Christmas has got a lot of mushrooms in it. They definitely, yeah, it does. Is, a, is an interesting one, Saint Nicholas. And they that, that they definitely break the uh, the right kind of mushrooms. Definitely break the matrix. Right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm I, I'm due for one. I haven't done one. In a while. The last thing though that I want to point out is the thing about the Buddha is he he. He did have, he had monks. So when you're talking about monks, you're talking about someone who's quite disciplined. They're wearing a right. certain outfit. You know, they've pretty much divorced the regular lifestyle. And I think that that image has stained our society a little bit mm -hmm. because you don't have to, if you can find your liberation, your enlightenment, without being a monk you don't have to be super strict you don't have to not have sex you don't have to not you could smoke cigarettes and be a killer and still mm. find your liberation mm. you know and and so that is the one thing that kind of the stigma that kind of came away from all this that you have to be a strict monk and people still right. will give up their life and go to a monastery or an ashram and they'll give their life to that. Um, but you don't have to. It might be right for some people because they might be like, no, I just want to get rid of everything. You know, mm -hmm. they don't care about money. They don't care about anything. It's like going to college for mindfulness. Right. <laughs> right. But as, you know, my mentor, Vishrant, and, you know, Osho and many others have said, when you're in the marketplace, mm -hmm. you're challenged more. Mm -hmm. Right. And Ram Das once said, if you really want to practice your mindfulness, if you really want to see how quote unquote enlightened you are, go hang out with your mom. Mm -hmm. Go <laughs> hang out with your parents for a week. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and true. I also think it it even goes beyond the question of is it harder, is it not harder? Right. I think it goes beyond that in the sense that what the hell is the worth? of waking up if you can't do it if if the vast majority of the population can't do it right is everyone going to travel to ashrams and and caves and you know they, they, there's too many people there's a society we have so if it and in and, and believing that it can only work in sit in a certain situation that is antagonistic that's the antithesis right of what surrender is that's the antithesis of acceptance and self-realization. Right. There are certain people who who probably are destined and are supposed to do that Absolutely. because they have to do that to go home out and be the teachers. But you're right. The real test is, can you do it? And this is what Osho said. This is what Yogananda said. You have to be it in the real world. You have to be a Buddha in the real world. You know, you have to be able to uh, live life here with mm that attitude the enlightened attitude and that's the that's the struggle i'm sure we all struggle with that i know well, i do <laughs> well vishran always says you know you're you know you get into a relationship and they'll become their best teacher yeah because they're mm. gonna you're you're gonna find where you get caught mm. you're gonna find when you get triggered mm. you know but instead of keep getting triggered over and over and over and over again it's like you're tripping on the same piece of wood or something wood yeah mm -hmm. you gotta mm -hmm. take a step back and you gotta you know get out break out a piece of paper or make notes in your phone and say oh okay this is tripping me up yeah you know okay these three things are tripping me up and now once you know what they are and you can this is what i do with my clinic yeah. right we got to find the root cause we don't want to treat the symptoms. We want to find the root cause. So mm. it's the same thing with mindfulness and spirituality. Find the root cause. Mm. And then you can work on the root cause. Mm. And it might take a few years, but mm. at least you know what it is. Ah, it is this self-awareness, you know, self-awareness. Yep. But I think there is important. no self to be aware of, mm. Kevin. 
That's right. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks for listening to Inner Peace with Dr. Reese. If this episode opened your heart, feel free to share on social media and tell your loved ones. Also, be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. Until next time, may peace be with you.
Thanks for listening to Inner Peace with Dr. Reese. If this episode opened your heart, feel free to share on social media and tell your loved ones. Also, be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. Until next time, may peace be with you.